Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jill Halliburton Sue and Deontay Rosilis? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Jill Halliburton Sue was born on March 16, 1955, and raised in California. Her great uncle was Earl Halliburton, the founder of the Halliburton Oil Empire, although this did not benefit Jill financially to any significant extent. Jill and her family moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1966. Sometime later, she moved to Florida. Jill was generous with her time and volunteered for a number of charitable causes. Eventually, she married a man named Nan Yao Su, and they had a daughter named Amanda and a son named Justin. Jill's husband, Nan Yao, had earned a Ph.D. in 1982 and had become wealthy after inventing a successful termite bait system. He worked for the University of Florida. The family lived in an expensive house in an upscale gated community in Davie, Florida, which is about 20 minutes west of Fort Lauderdale. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On September 7, 2014, Jill and her husband had returned home to Davie, Florida. They had been in Malaysia for two weeks. On the morning of September 8, it was back to life as usual. In the morning, Nan Yao drove to his job at the university. Justin left the house at about 9.15 a.m. and drove to a community college campus. 59-year-old Jill was the only one in the house. At some point, after her husband and son left the house, a man named Deontay Rosilis broke through the glass in the back door and made entry into the residence. He went into Justin's room and retrieved knives. Apparently, Justin had an extensive knife collection. At some point during the burglary, Deontay and Jill came into contact. She tried to escape out of the front door but Deontay dragged her back into the house and knocked her unconscious. He tied her hands and her feet and put her in a bathtub. He then stabbed her 25 times, killing her. Sometime just after noon that day, Nan Yao checked his home surveillance cameras from his office at work. He noticed a man with a face covering walking in his living room. He only saw the image for a few seconds before the live feed disappeared from his computer. The man he saw was Deontay. Just after being spotted on video surveillance, Deontay ripped two cameras off of the walls. When Deontay exited the house, he took the cameras with him. Nan Yao was understandably concerned by spotting this mysterious man in his living room. He called his son Justin and asked him to return home to check on Jill. Justin returned to the gated community where he lived and entered the house through the garage. He noticed wires hanging on the wall where the cameras used to be. Justin went to his room and noticed that some of his knives were missing from his knife collection. He discovered his mother's body in the bathtub after hearing water running. Justin called 911. He told the operator that his mother must have stabbed herself and then thrown herself into the bathtub. After pulling her body out of the bathtub and realizing that her hands and feet were tied, Justin revised his theory about what happened. He told the operator that he thought it was murder. Here's what the police found after responding to the scene. Jill Sue had clearly been murdered, meaning Justin's second theory was correct. Justin had his mother's blood on him. This was because he tried to perform CPR, but of course the police were suspicious about this. The alarm control panel box for the house was in the bathtub under Jill's body. It had been destroyed. Also, under her body was one of Justin's knives, a large hunting knife which had been a gift from his mother. Another one of his knives was found right outside the front door of the house. It was a folding knife. Various belongings were scattered throughout the house, as if somebody had been intent on committing theft, but nothing was actually missing other than the two security cameras. The police said that the crime scene looked like it was staged. The police initially believed that Justin could have been responsible for the murder, 
They had a few reasons to believe this. Justin discovered his mother's body. Her blood was on him. One of his knives was used to kill her. He had initially suggested that his mother had brought an end to her own life, which clearly she didn't. His father described the figure that he spotted on the surveillance camera as a thin white man. Justin had dropped out of college not long before the murders. He had argued with his mother and father about this decision. Justin was caught in several lies. For example, he was supposed to be going to class at the university, but he told the police that he was in the library. Later, he said that he was actually sleeping in his car in a parking garage. This seemed like an unusual location to take a nap, considering that September in Florida isn't typically known for its cool temperatures. Justin told a story about how he took a knife from his car into the house, like to defend himself, but later he put the knife back in his car. He eventually told the police that he lied about taking the knife from his car in the first place. The police interrogated Justin for 11 hours. They falsely accused him of murdering his mother. Justin maintained his innocence. He never asked for an attorney, which was unwise. When the police looked at the surveillance video for the gated community where the Sioux residence was located, they realized that Justin could not have been the killer. He was seen in his vehicle leaving the neighborhood at 9.15 a.m. and returning at 12.30 p.m. He was not there when the murder was committed. Justin was excluded as a potential suspect. The police continued their investigation. Eventually, DNA testing would point to a suspect. DNA from Deontay Rizzilli's was found in three different locations at the crime scene. It was on the folding knife that was dropped by the front door, on a belt that had been used to restrain Jill, and later it was found on the broken glass from the back door of the house. On September 8, 2014, 10 days after the homicide, Deontay was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. On July 15, 2016, during a routine hearing before his trial, Deontay escaped from a courtroom with the help of several conspirators. Before being taken to the courtroom, Deontay was supplied with a handcuff key from a jail guard, and the chain around his waist was unlocked by another inmate. Deontay entered the courtroom along with a number of other prisoners and sat down in the jury box. He used the handcuff key to remove his restraints, and he ran out of the courtroom. As he was making his way out of the building through the hallways and stairwells, he removed his prison jumpsuit. He was wearing street clothes underneath. Deontay then climbed into a getaway vehicle, which was waiting for him. It took the police six days to find him. He was hiding at a hotel in West Palm Beach. Deontay went to trial for murder. In December 2021, the jury returned a verdict of manslaughter, which was a shocking result based on the evidence. As the judge was polling the jury, one juror, the foreperson, indicated that manslaughter was not her verdict. She believed that Deontay was guilty of first-degree murder. A mistrial was declared. Deontay was tried again in early 2022. This time he was convicted of first-degree murder. His sentence was life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. Many people believe that Deontay Rizzilis is not guilty. They believe that racism was involved in his prosecution. Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that Deontay was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. Deontay was a career criminal who had committed several burglaries. His typical tactic for making entry into a residence was to break out the glass from a back door. His DNA was found on three different items at the crime scene, all of which could be tied to criminal behavior, broken glass, a belt used to tie the victim, and a knife. It's not like the DNA was found in areas that could be explained innocently. Deontay lied about his alibi. He was in Davie, Florida on the day of the murder. Deontay conspired with seven people to escape from custody and conspired with nine others to fabricate an alibi. Moving to the exculpatory factors, killers typically don't use a knife from inside the house although there have been exceptions to this. The large hunting knife used to murder Jill did not have Deontay's DNA on it. Only the smaller folding knife did. Despite being a career criminal, Deontay had been nonviolent. During another burglary where he was confronted, 
he simply ran away. When considering the evidence, do I think that Deontay was guilty? Yes, I believe that he is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There is no other good explanation for how his DNA was found at the crime scene. Moving to the next section, here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, the surveillance video of the killer was not available as evidence. The Sioux family had a trial subscription to record the video from the cameras. It expired just before the murder. The image that Nan Yao was looking at was from a live feed. It was not saved. Item number two, after the first trial, the jury initially voted for manslaughter. This was a fortunate verdict for Deontay because instead of life in prison, he would have only served a maximum of 15 years. The jury foreperson said that she had been pressured by three other jurors to vote for manslaughter. Considering recent events highlighting racial injustice, like the murder of George Floyd, they did not want to convict a black man of committing murder. They just couldn't bring themselves to vote guilty. It's worth noting that at least one of those jurors denied this allegation. After allegedly being pressured into voting for manslaughter, the jury foreperson noticed that Deontay and his defense attorneys were celebrating after hearing the verdict. She said that it was like he graduated from high school or made the winning touchdown at a football game. This led her to speak out, which of course resulted in a mistrial. If Deontay could have only contained his joy after being convicted of a serious felony, he may have had a much shorter sentence. Item number three, the police initially falsely accused Justin Sue of being the killer. One officer even suggested that he would consider a career change if he was wrong about Justin. The police eventually gave Justin a half-hearted apology for the false accusation. One officer defended his tactics by saying he was trying to be the voice of the victim. So I guess he believes that Justin's mother would have wanted her son to be falsely accused for her murder. It doesn't sound like that officer thought his statement through very carefully. I think that what the police sometimes forget is there is such a thing as a bad voice for a victim. Just being a voice is not enough. They must function as an accurate voice. Victims using these police officers as their voice would be like a famous band who is having a movie made about them finding out that they are going to be played by Millie Vanilli. I can certainly appreciate why the police initially suspected Justin. There's no question that the evidence they had at that time didn't look too good for him. The problem is their false accusation against Justin was used in favor of Deontay at his trial. The police hoped that they would be recording a confession, but it was actually the officer's wild accusations that became problematic for the state. All the police managed to do with the interrogation was to create another victim. Now Justin has to deal with the memory of being falsely accused of his mother's murder for 11 hours. The reality of police interrogations is that the police will continue for as long as they feel like if a citizen does not assert their right to remain silent. No one should ever talk to the police under any circumstances. The police manipulate and deceive all the time, yet if someone who they are interviewing lies to them, that could be considered a crime. It is not a level playing field. The police have something to gain, whereas the citizen has everything to lose. Item number four. The police initially insisted that the crime scene was staged, this was because only the surveillance cameras were missing from the house. In looking at the crime scene, it's not clear how the police made this determination. The evidence was highly consistent with an interrupted burglary, and that is in fact what happened. The police would have us believe that they can look at a drawer pulled out of a dresser and determine the motive of the person who pulled that drawer out. It's almost as if they believe they have magical powers. Item number five, one of the most amazing parts of this case is how successful Deontay was at manipulating people. Altogether, he assembled at least 16 conspirators for different endeavors, like his escape plan and his fabricated alibi. Thousands of people still support Deontay. They believe that he is innocent. He was even able to convince a jail guard to give him a handcuff key. The guard was also Haitian American and therefore empathized with Deontay. I think that Deontay's story connected with a lot of people because of its potential association to racial injustice. But if they look more diligently into this case, they will see that this case is not a good example of racial injustice. 
It is an example of a man who murdered an innocent woman by stabbing her 25 times. It is a good idea to be on the lookout for discrimination of any type, whether it's based on race, gender, age, disability, or any other protected characteristic. It's also important to be aware that criminals often use ongoing societal issues to explain why they were convicted. Now moving to my final thoughts. As Deontay sits in prison, he has pinned his hopes for release on Kim Kardashian, a notorious social media influencer who routinely advocates for prisoners. I think this is a good indication that Deontay will never get out of prison. This could actually be a way that prisoners could be categorized as far as their level of denial. I can picture an experienced inmate giving a tour of a prison to a new inmate. As they walk down a corridor and look in different cells, the experienced inmate talks about each of the prisoners. This guy is hoping to impress the parole board with good behavior. He's not making waves. That guy is betting on his appeal to district court. He'll be happy to show you the law library. The new inmate interrupts him. What about that guy over there? The experienced inmate gets a despondent look on his face. Well, there's no reasoning with that guy. He has reached the Kim Kardashian stage. Those are my thoughts on the case of Jill Halbert and Sue and Deontay Rizillis. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.